OK, we start here, and we're in the land of the very small. I'm actually controlling this little guy around here. Um, this is basically cellular scale. This is the start of a video I must have watched hundreds of times. I know every single frame of it, every single sound. Hearing the water drop sound effect at the beginning alone makes me nostalgic. It's the first presentation of the video game Spore, which allows the player to create its own animal species and guide it from its beginnings as a microscopic organism through development as an intelligent creature to interstellar exploration. It made such an impression on me because I am a huge fan of simulation games, playing a lot of Roller Coaster Tycoon, Transport Tycoon and Zoo Tycoon these days, and obviously The Sims and SimCity, both creations of the absolute master of simulation games, Will Wright. A few years before I saw that Spore video, I had an idea for a game like The Sims, but for animals. I think this idea might have been influenced by Sim Park, a game also created by Will Wright's company Maxis, which I played at a friend's house. I wanted two things totally different though. Firstly, I wanted to be able to create all species myself. I imagined the in-game camera panning through a dense rainforest full of plants and animals that I had designed myself. Secondly, I wanted the option to have these animals evolve. You can imagine my enthusiasm that Will Wright was going to build a game like this. I mean, there's no better person in the world to build this game, and he was actually doing it. I got the game. Of course, Galactic Edition, on launch day, and I love many things about it. I love the creature editor in particular because the problem, how do you let players create their own animals, was not only explored, but basically solved. But it was not a simulation game. It was a top-down arcade game, it was an action-adventure game, it was mostly a strategy game, but it was nowhere even close to a simulation game. Hi, for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. In this video I want to tell the story of why I started building the sapling, everything that happened after that, up until where I am today. A few years after Spore was released, I was thinking about my old ecosystem simulation idea and I suddenly realized what could be the first step towards making it. A simulation of individual plants collecting sunlight and water, I'm ignoring nutrients for simplicity, turning them into energy and have them reproduce once they collected enough. So that was my first step simulation wise. The first step visualization wise was to figure out how to build 3D models of these plants on the fly. I decided to do it similar to how I model a plant in Blender, which is to simply extrude a cube a few times and then apply Catmull Clark subdivision to it to make it look smoother. The Unity game engine, however, does not have a built in implementation of Catmull Clark subdivision, so implementing this algorithm in C Sharp was my first project. At the time, I had several years of programming experience under my belt, but I didn't know if that was enough for this project, so this was my way to prove to myself that I could really build this game. Indeed, the code I wrote back then is still a critical component of the game until this very day. It's used by all plants and animals all the time, and what players don't realize when they are using the editor is that under the hood they are actually building these simplistic blocky creatures, which are then subdivided into better looking ones. I say simplistic, but it turns out you still need a lot of geometry to get all sides, branches and body parts to face the right way, and my geometry knowledge was super basic when I started. I often got into a situation where I could describe exactly what I needed and it seemed highly likely that this problem was already solved by a great mathematician in the 1800s or so. But I had no clue what kind of terminology was available to Google it. Let's just say I learned a lot of things about geometry in a really short amount of time. My first idea was to show the simulation in an endless blue world with no clear horizon as you can see in these screenshots. I thought it looked pretty and created something of a laboratory feel really highlighting that the player is doing their own experiments with evolution. But then I saw the colorful, otherworldly skies of Astroneer and decided that was much closer to my original alien jungle idea. So I went for floating islands instead and had the camera fly around them as an intro to each level, which I felt looked pretty as well. This is an early screenshot of the plant editor. You can see how at this point I was still visualizing energy as dots, similar to how I visualize other metrics like sunlight and groundwater. 
This felt like an elegant system in the beginning, but as I needed to visualize more and more energy, I had to resort to using other color dots to summarize, for example, 10 energy, and then yet another color for 50, etc. The longer I used it, the more the system fell apart and became hard to understand for new playtesters. In the end, I decided to give up and switch to energy bars instead. The first build of the game consisted of three main elements, all of which I already mentioned. The plant editor, the animal editor and the world view with the floating islands where you see the simulation. The editors in particular were a lot simpler than they are today, with much fewer body parts. But despite this, playtesters clearly showed that even at this point the game was already too complex to be understood without something of a tutorial. To fix this, I included four scenarios. The island, the mountain, the creature and the disaster. These scenarios are again subdivided into milestones, inspired by city skylines, so I could introduce all of the game's complexity milestone by milestone. Speaking about playtesters, when I first put this game in front of friends, the results were... disappointing. All the systems that I thought were super exciting and easy to learn were actually unclear and frustrating to every single playtester. I also took the game to Playdev Club, which was an event organized several times per year in the Netherlands where game developers could give feedback on each other's games. While some of the developers seemed to like the editors, it was quite clear again that nobody was really enjoying actually putting new organisms in the world. One of the playtesters even asked me if he could stop. As you can imagine, this was a really uncertain time for me, because there was no way for me to tell whether I had a good idea and that it was just the execution that needed improvement, or that I had an idea that maybe seemed fun in my head, but wasn't that much fun to actually play. Maybe I was trying to squeeze fun out of an idea that had no fun inside. For some reason though, stopping was never really an option, but at around this time I made the scope of the game as small as I could, so that if it failed it was just a smallish failed experiment and I could move on to another project quickly. So I kept going, and based on playtesters feedback I was able to pinpoint which complexity in a simulation was just complexity for complexity's sake, that is complexity that did not lead to more depth and interesting interactions, and greatly improved the UI so playtesters could better tell what was happening. A pivotal moment during this period was feedback by Adrian de Jong, among many cool things creator of the game Hidden Folks, who identified that the game needed more juice. Juice is a term game developers use for little interactive moments in a game that are mostly unrelated to the main gameplay, but still really improve the experience because human beings like to get direct feedback on their actions. So I added a lot more sound effects, I added that you see your plants actually grow, I added that you see your creatures fall into the world and a little cloud of dust when it reaches the ground and many more things and only then, suddenly, some of the playtesters started showing excitement. For the first time I got the feeling that some people could actually see what I saw in my head. Despite this I remained unsure about whether the game would be interesting to more people. I decided to take a break when I became a father and then take the ultimate test and release the game I had at that point and only continue working on it if it turned out to be a success. For this reason, in the original promotional material there is no mention of anything that I might be doing in the future as I wasn't so sure there was going to be a future for this project. I originally even planned to just give the game a full release immediately and don't even call it early access. I published the Steam page in November 2019, which caused some talk about the game here and there, but was nothing close to what I'd hoped for when I started the project. I reached out to a few colleague game developers for help, and came into contact with Philomena Schwab, who among other games developed Niche. She gave me lots of useful marketing advice and convinced me to give the game an early access phase, if only because Steam would give the game two waves of attention instead of just one. Launch day sparked only a handful of sales, continuing the trend of very little attention, so I was ready to do some final support and then drop the project. But then something unexpected happened. I was doing some unrelated reading on video game trailers and how they are structured, and I suddenly realized I wanted to make such a trailer myself. So I started fantasizing what kind of cool things I would put in such a trailer, and slowly but steadily the flower update began to take shape. It's kind of weird when you think of it. I only continued working on this game because I suddenly got an unexplainable desire to make a video game trailer and this was the most suitable project I had for it. I do believe however that this end result focused mindset is actually what saved the project as it is a really effective way of making sure I focus on the things that get players excited, making sure you can understand what's going on in the game by just looking at it, and making sure the game is not just a deep and complex simulation, but also contains some eye candy so it makes a better first impression. As for eye candy, I included glowing body parts for both plants and animals and instinct to go towards lights in the dark. 
To really make the new glowing body part stand out, I added a bloom image filter to the camera that turns on at night. The second bit of eye candy was, obviously, flowers, or to be more precise, pollination, so plants can mix their genes. So if you have this plant, and also this plant, and they both have the same pollination organ, their offspring can look like this. This one uses a wind pollination organ, but most of the pollination organs in the games don't use wind, but require animals to spread the pollen, and thus have bright colors to attract them. In exchange, the animals got a third new food source, which is nectar. I added two new mouths that are capable of eating it. Once a nectar eater eats at one plant and then at another with the same flower type, it will unknowingly mix its genes. Despite my focus on eye candy, the most substantial new feature of the flower update is still something below the hood, namely massive optimizations. So far the game was mostly played on small 10x10 square grids. While this was okay-ish for the scenarios, there was nothing meaningful you could do in the sandbox without running out of space. I've written an interactive blog post about one of the major optimization techniques I'm using. The link is below if you're interested in the details, but the short version is that a lot of the plants and animals you see on screen are not 100% correct, but just an approximation of what they probably look like. So if a plant evolves to be a bit taller, the game will not immediately drop everything it is doing to rebuild the corresponding model, but instead it will reuse the ancestor model until it has time to build the correct one. I essentially made the game fake it before it makes it. One of the things I did to promote the flower update a bit was to live stream the game on Twitch for 7 days continuously with random mutations turned on. This way I could showcase how you can now run the simulated evolution on a larger map and have interesting things happen. Unfortunately, it did not attract that much attention. I did spend a lot of time and some money to get it all to run on an external server though, so to not throw away all that work at the end of the livestream, I decided to dig up the save files and make a video explaining what happened, inspired by YouTube channel Bibliridian. To my surprise, this summary video quickly became the most watched video on the channel, and the most successful marketing effort I had ever done. Armed with this new knowledge, I decided to do another major update, named the Fight and Flight update, and showcase it in the form of devlog videos. This devlog series you can of course watch on this channel if you're interested in the details, but to give you a high level overview, the main focus of this update was to add much more variety to the animals in the game, and to the interactions between animals. For example, predators can no longer just eat all other animals as a whole, and predators will have to kill the larger animals first. To make this work, I've added a number of new attack and defense related body parts. If aggression is not an option, predators can also eat their prey's babies instead. Or their eggs, which now also is a new thing animals can have. To decrease vulnerability, animals may want to shorten the time embryos need to develop inside these eggs. Having beaks instead of teeth helps with this. The eye candy for this update is of course flight. This starts with climbing in trees, then gliding and finally flying. These actions are linked not only because climbing arms can evolve into gliders, which can evolve into wings, but also because they share the same weight system. From now on, it can also be advantageous for animals to drop body parts and body fat, because it allows animals to climb and glide, and eventually fly. This is a trade-off though, because also new in this update is the fact that animals can no longer live in all temperatures. Body fat protects animals in colder areas, whereas having large body parts helps them lose heat in hotter ones. On top of this, animals can now have fur and feathers for cold climates and skills for warm climates. After the release of the Fight and Flight update, I took a few weeks off to welcome my second daughter and then did the 7 day livestream showcasing the evolution mechanic, as you saw in the previous two videos. The results were even more extreme than last time. Even fewer people watched the livestream, but the summary video attracted tens of thousands of viewers, leading to the largest influx of new players the game had ever seen. And this is where I am right now. On the one hand, the player-made jungle that I dreamed up nearly two decades ago is clearly within reach these days. You can go on Steam or Itch right now, buy the game and actually create these trees and animals as you see fit. On the other hand, the ecosystems and real jungles on Earth are infinitely more varied and complex, and the list of interesting phenomena in nature that I would like to add to the game grows on a daily basis. I imagine this enormous list of things that are part of real ecosystems on Earth but not part of the game would be demoralizing to some, but for me, this is just a giant, exciting space to explore. Oh, and one more thing. I'm nearly ready with the third big update, which I will again reveal in the form of six devlogs, one video per week, starting next week.